Episode 143 of the Read to Lead podcast is brought to you once again by cloud accounting software FreshBooks, offering a 30-day unrestricted free trial to you. To claim it, go to freshbooks.com slash read to lead and enter read to lead in the how did you hear about us section. When you put people in a room and say, okay, you've got an hour to brainstorm, guess what? You've just invited stress into the room because people start to say, well, I I don't know. How do I brainstorm? What's my best idea? Welcome to the Read to Lead podcast with Jeff Brown. Jeff believes that if you desire to achieve true success in business and in life, then consistent and intentional reading is a must. The Read to Lead podcast will not only help you narrow this ever important reading list, but also bring you key insights and valuable feedback from some of today's most successful and inspiring authors. And now here's Jeff. I am so glad you're here. Welcome to the podcast that is dedicated to your personal and professional growth. It all boils down to the singular topic of leadership, but related to that are things like personal growth, productivity, career, business, marketing, sales, and entrepreneurship. In fact, this week we'll touch on leadership, sales, and marketing together. In a moment, you and I are going to be joined by Dan Rome. Dan is the best-selling author of a number of books, the latest of which is called Draw to Win, the crash course on how to lead, sell, and innovate with your visual mind. I'll ask Dan about how simple drawings can bring clarity to your ideas and your communication, what he says to anyone who says, but I can't draw, how visual tools can help you see old things with a fresh perspective, and much, much more. Speaking of fresh, I want to take a moment to tell you about our sponsor for this episode. I'm talking, of course, about cloud accounting software, FreshBooks. They have relaunched their entire platform, and they're telling me the reason they're doing this is because of the new economy. The nature of work is changing. You know that. I know that. We talk about that on the show from time to time. The Internet has helped more and more of us earn income apart from a regular job. Some of us are able to do that Full time. In fact, as we become more connected, more autonomous, many of us are working in new jobs that couldn't even have been imagined just a few years ago. Think about this just a few years ago, working for yourself was looked down upon. If you worked for yourself, it was because you couldn't get a real job, but that's no longer the case. One in three Americans today is self employed. By 2020, that group will make up 40% of the U.S. workforce. And in light of all this, FreshBooks has worked really, really hard to make accounting something that I don't want to do ridiculously easy. Their software makes that possible, and it's completely transformed how freelancers and small business owners deal with their day-to-day paperwork. You might be saying, well, Jeff, I don't have my own business. Have you ever wanted to start a side business or a side hustle? Maybe you think, like our guest today, Dan Rome, that no matter how good you are at doing what you do, our rapidly changing world is sooner or later going to demand that you do something else Not worrying about how you're going to account for it all is going to take a huge weight off your shoulders. Trust me, as a user of FreshBooks cloud accounting software for seven years, I know. There's absolutely no obligation to take advantage of their free, all options and features included 30-day trial. And you don't need a credit card for the trial either. Go to freshbooks.com slash read to lead and enter read to lead when you get to the how did you hear about us section. One more time, that's freshbooks.com slash read to lead. Dan Rome is the internationally best-selling author of five books on visual communication, including The Back of the Napkin, Blah, 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 and Show and Tell. And he's the founder of the Napkin Academy, the world's first online visual training program. He's helped leaders at Microsoft, Boeing, eBay, Kraft, Gap, IBM, the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Senate, and the White House solve complex problems with simple pictures. Dan and his whiteboard even have appeared on CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, Fox, and NPR. Well, his brand new book is called Draw to Win, a crash course on how to lead, sell, and innovate with your visual mind. It's a pleasure to have him back on Read to Lead. Dan, welcome. Why, Jeff, thanks so much. Well, if you missed our first conversation, that was back in episode 41. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. That's centered around Dan's last book, Show and Tell. Um, and I want to start, Dan, by asking you maybe what drove you to write this book and and talk a bit, if you would, about the science and what it says uh, about what our brains dedicate to the visual. 
Well, absolutely. So, so Jeff, I'm one of those guys I've just drawn all my life. And when I started in business, that made me kind of a weirdo because most people in business don't draw. But now, happily, <laughs> uh, that's starting to become a little bit more normal that people in business would talk about the power of visuals. You know, the real impetus behind this book, Draw to Win, was an anniversary. And the anniversary <laughs> was prompted by my publisher, Penguin Portfolio, coming and saying, hey, Dan, it's been 10 years since uh, we commissioned you mm. to write the back of the napkin. What's changed in the last 10 years? And I looked over my notes and my calendar for 10 years, and I realized, my gosh, 10 years since I wrote the back of the napkin. Well, here's what's happened. I've given 720 presentations to over 128 different organizations around the world, and I've drawn well over 10,000 pictures in that time. So I thought, let's consider this kind of a greatest hits. <laughs> of the 10 years since I got started down this path of visual communication for business people, what are the 10 honest to goodness, the 10 commandments, the 10 rules that I have learned that really, really work. And that's what I've condensed and worked through and make up the heart and soul of Draw to Win. It really is, mm -hmm. if you really seriously want to try to be more visual in your thinking, in your communication, in your sales, in your leadership, and I think you need to, by the way, but that's something we'll talk about here in a moment. <laughs> These are the 10 things you really, truly need to know. Well, speaking of, of back of the napkin, I don't know if I told you the story uh, last time, but I worked for a leader uh, at around the time that that book came out who was a um, very giving person. And uh, one of the things we did as a team, as a staff, was read a lot and discuss the books that we were reading. And, and after uh, a meeting one time, we went to the bookstore and uh, it was his treat uh, for us to pick out any book uh, in, this, in the bookstore we wanted and he would pay for it. And I chose Back of the Napkin. That was my entry into Dan Rome. I like this boss of yours. I, I like that generosity. Yeah, we need to get an email address for this gentleman. Yes. Uh, I'm delighted to hear it. And you asked Jeff a moment ago about the science. And I, you know, I have a, a minor in science from my undergraduate. So I, I studied biology. So I know enough to be dangerous. But what I've done over these last many years is I've always been fascinated by why was it that sometimes when I was drawing a picture in a meeting or to make a presentation, Everyone in the room would say, Dan, that's it. That's perfect. And the meeting would move along just like, just fluidly, just flow along. It'd be great. Mm -hmm. And then there'd be other times that I draw a picture and the whole room would just stop and it would be kind of like the gears would grind and people say, uh, Dan, can, can you just talk to us? We don't get the picture. And so, Jeff, what I, I, what I really sought out to do is try to understand from a neuromechanical cognitive science perspective, mm -hmm. why is it that certain types of pictures – move the meeting forward and other type of pictures cause us to stop. Mm. And I, I realized that a lot of it has to do with underpinnings of how vision works, this crazy, miraculous, incredible process by which our brains turn literally billions and billions of photons of light, electrical signals, mm. into meaning in our mind. And the fact that we do that constantly thousands of times a second and that the whole process takes less than one-tenth of a second. And anybody who's ever opened their eyes and looked ahead of them knows exactly what I'm talking about. You're driving your car or you're walking down the road. Constantly, this light is coming in and your brain is turning it into meaning. Where do I go? Which direction do I go? What should I do? The decision-making power of that visual engine is remarkable. And when you start to break down the pieces of it, you realize that from a cognitive, neuromechanical perspective, vision works the same in all people. It's the same way that most all of us walk. You know, mm -hmm. We all walk with a slightly different hitch in our get-along, but for the most part, we all walk in pretty much the same way. We all run in pretty much the same way. We breathe in pretty much the same way. Well, guess what? We see neuromechanically in the same way. And the scientists that are studying this are coming to realize that the underlying mechanics of vision, although extraordinarily complicated, can be described from a process perspective. And this, let me roll this back to where I began. Mm. It was realizing that vision works according to a set of discrete visual pathways, that we could map out each of those pathways into this set of simple pictures at a very discrete level and say, guess what? If you draw these simple set of pictures, and I've come down to six different pictures, if you draw them in order you can pretty much guarantee that you will understand anything you're seeking to understand, and you can convey any idea, no matter how complex, to any other group of people 
because we're simply mapping into exactly the way vision works. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Uh, what do you say, though, and I know you hear this a lot, to that person who's, who says, but I can't draw or I, uh, I'm not a visual learner. You say that's a deceptive trap. How do, you, how do you address that response? Well, I like to make it really clear up front that when I'm talking about drawing pictures and being visual, I am not talking about an artistic process. I don't care. Nobody cares how effectively <laughs> and how beautifully you draw your picture. That's not the point. Mm. When we think about drawing, we're thinking about it as a thinking process and more importantly, importantly, a clear thinking process. The drawing that I'm talking about is not about beautifully trying to channel your inner Rembrandt or Michelangelo or something like that. I don't care if the picture that you draw is just a series of stick figures that look like a kindergarten drew them. That's probably ideal. All we want are some circles, some boxes, some arrows, maybe a few stick figures, maybe a few labels, a few simple little icons. If you want to show that there's an objective at the end of this, draw me a little triangular shaped mountain and put a, sh a sunny circle over the top of it. Now I know that that's my destination. If you can draw those things, what you're actually keying off of is the underlying building blocks of thought. And that's what I want people to try to recognize. So I'm going to say it one more time. Not, a, not an artistic process. It's a thinking process. And by the way, the type of drawing that I like to do, I can pretty much teach anybody in the world how to do it in about three minutes. It's that simple. Uh, you hinted to this uh, a moment ago, but I want to I dig a little deeper. You talked about the six kinds of pictures, uh, and there really are just six to explain just about anything. Why is it that the order in which they're presented is, is so important? Well, here's, here's a magical, insightful moment. Vision is predictable. Vision is 100% predictable. That is to say, if I'm going to show you something, if I know enough about how the visual system works, and at this point, I think that I do, mm -hmm. uh, I can determine pretty accurately which type of visual information your visual system is looking for at each moment in my description. So that's a long-winded way of saying the way that we make sense of the visual world in front of us is a process, and it's based on a series of six different visual pathways. And happily, they have beautifully simple names the scientists have given them. One of them, for example, is called the who pathway. Another one is called the how pathway. Another one is called the where pathway, and so on. And the simple six comes down to who and what, how much, where, when, how, and why. And those are the six pictures that we're going to draw because it turns out that increasing, in, fr starting out from just identifying what am I looking at, through then counting how many are there, through then trying to get a sense of what is the position of those objects relative to each other, vision is predictable. When we're showing a picture to someone, let's say we're making a PowerPoint presentation and we're introducing a, a new product or a new service. Imagine if we simply did this. The first picture simply says, this is what my product looked like and this is who it's for. Okay, and then the next picture says, this is how many of those people there are out there. This is how big the market space is. This is how big my product is. Fine. And then the next picture shows a little two by two or a little map that says, the people that we want to reach are over here, but we're over here. Our product is over here. Then the next picture is a timeline that says, we are going to move these people over in this direction. We're going to move our product over here. Then we draw a little flow chart that shows how we're going to do it. And we cap the whole thing off with our sixth picture, our why picture, which in a way is a very simple sort of visual moral to the story, meaning mm. if we've done this right, the end result will be happier people, more products sold. Those are the six pictures. You can tell any story by mapping them out in that order. Does that make sense, Jeff? Uh, it makes total sense. Uh, one of the things that, that grabs my attention is uh, we're talking about drawing here and oftentimes drawing live and in real time in the moment. But talk a little bit, Dan, about the distinction between that and, say, a typical you know PowerPoint presentation. Well, you know, PowerPoint is a tool that is much maligned. And, and ironically, over the years, I've, I've had a number of opportunities to work with the good folks at Microsoft up at Redmond in, mm -hmm. uh, in Seattle area and down here in the San Francisco Bay area. And, uh, you know, we always sit and kind of commiserate how PowerPoint has become the sort of the whipping child for all that's bad about presentations. Mm -hmm. And we all kind of come to the agreement, and I can't speak on behalf of Microsoft, but I know my own personal opinion is uh, PowerPoint's a great tool, but the downside of it is it makes us too easy to be lazy in our thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, PowerPoint is built to try to make it very easy to put together very long and detailed presentations. And so what most of us do is we just keep adding in new pages and new bullets and more stuff and more stuff until we've got everything we know about a topic jammed into our PowerPoint deck. And then we go and we show it to someone else and they're overwhelmed in about three minutes. And 
A lot of it goes back to cognitive science. Number one, nobody looking at a screen wants to read something that's being read to them by the person who's up there speaking. <laughs> right. So it's so what I do instead is I use PowerPoint, I use other tools, but I simply put pictures in my in my slides and maybe one headline, one drawing or a photograph, and then one very short piece of text. One idea per page. You go through each page very, very quickly. And then what I do, and I think this is very, very important back to the kind of the science of keeping the visual mind awake, is I literally draw on my slides in real time throughout the entire presentation. And that, Jeff, is where the magic happens. When nothing, nothing, frankly, nothing is more powerful to an audience that you can get away with legally, frankly, than you (laughs) talking and drawing a summary of what you're saying at the same time that you're saying it. And the picture that you draw, again, it's a simple stick figure or a simple arrow, or even as basic as having a picture that's pre-created in your slideshow that you're presenting, but then you mark it up as you talk. And you say, this piece over here, and you're drawing a circle around it. This is the important piece. And then you draw an arrow going over to the next piece. You literally draw that arrow, and you say, this is the process by which we're going to move over to this end state. And then you kind of circle the triangle that's the last step. The act of marking it up literally draws in your viewer's eyes to a point that they simply cannot look away. (laughs) Think about it like this. Imagine a circle. Draw a circle in, in, in your mind's eye, if you would. You're just drawing a circle on a piece of paper now. Color in about half that circle. It is estimated that anywhere from about a third to a half of your entire brain is probably there to help you process vision in terms of sheer um, neuron capacity. Probably that amount of your brain is dedicated to help you processing vision more than any other thing that we do. And so what we want to do is all of us have an enormous investment in our visual engine, if you will, because we're burning a lot of calories. Our brain is the organ in our body that demands the most calories of any other organ that we have. In fact, here's another interesting data point. In, t- in typical adult Americans, our brain represents about two, two and a half percent of our total body weight. It's not a lot of weight. It's a small piece of our body. And yet our brain consumes about 20 percent of all the calories that we're burning when we're at rest. Hmm. So if you think about it, our brain is consuming more energy than any other organ in our body. And more of our brain is dedicated to processing vision than any other thing that we do. We have an incredible investment in vision. So here's the secret that I give to people who are presenters. The moment you get on stage and you roll out your PowerPoint and you start start showing your bullet lists, think about this. Your audience has an enormous investment in its visual system. Our brain expects a very high return on investment. If there is nothing interesting to look at, our brain is going to check out. It (laughs) takes about two minutes for that to happen. So here's the way you counter it. Every two minutes change your image or mark up your image. Give the visual mind something to see again and some nuance to pay attention to, and you can keep people paying attention to you without break for hours. That's the secret. You know, I can attest to that uh, in a couple of ways. One is I gave a, a presentation just a couple of weeks ago where I wasn't in a position where I could mark the slides in real time. But I did change them out. It was about a 30-minute presentation, and I changed them out about every 30 seconds. It was about 60 slides in 30 minutes and nothing on the screen for very long and very much you know, image-driven primarily with just you know, a little bit of text here and there. Got some of the best feedback from any presentation I've ever done. That's number one. Number two is having seen Dan present in person, uh, I, I can attest to the fact that everything he just said is absolutely true. It's very, very, very powerful. Uh, well, let's relate this to the sales process specifically, Dan, and 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 how to know when it's the right time to to hand the pen to the person that you're selling to. Okay, well, let's touch this on two ways. Number one, I would like to increase people's understanding and use of the visuals in sales, period. So, mm. you know, there's a there's a kind of a meme out there in the business world these days. We'll talk about whiteboard selling or visual selling. I'm behind it completely because I know it really works. Most of my career has been in consultative sales. That means I have been a salesperson for consulting companies selling large strategic technological solutions to very large organizations and often to smaller entrepreneurial organizations as well. So I'm the person who finds myself more often than not in the meeting room, in the boardroom, trying to make a pitch. And what I've learned is I build my PowerPoint in advance. We work with the team. We create all of the buttoned up documentation. That's great. But then we do something that most people don't. Before going into the presentation of this slideshow or this deck, 
we review it one more time with the simple idea in mind, realistically, we're going to have the attention of our audience for a brief period of time. What are the three things that we really, really want them to know and remember? Out of the 87 things we've got to share with them, what are the three that are really going to make the greatest difference? What would be the simple picture that we would draw live to emphasize those three? And that's what we focus our energy on. Mm. Kind of the subtext, Jeff, here is that if you're the person who in the middle of a meeting is willing, if you have the guts and the courage and you know the practice to do it, to stand up and say, wait a minute, I would like to map out what we're talking about. Do you mind if I take the pen and draw on this whiteboard or on this flip chart? No one's ever going to say no. On the contrary, they're going to say, please go ahead, because anything's better than flipping through more of these bullet points. If you have the courage to do that, what you will find is you will look like a genius. Now, I often make the comparison, it may be inappropriate, I don't know, but to stand-up comedians. If you have a favorite stand-up comic, you watch that person on stage and you just think they are the smartest, funniest you know, person you've ever seen. But think about this. They rehearsed that hundreds and hundreds of times so that it could look spontaneous. We visual thinkers do the same thing. We identify the pictures that are going to make a difference and we practice them. We practice them to build the confidence so that we're in the meeting. We can go up to the whiteboard and, and kind of with the appearance of being a little bit off the cuff, say, do you mind if I just draw this out? And then we proceed to draw our triangle and our three circles and our two arrows and our two stick figures talking while we do it. And it's going to look magical because we practiced it. (laughs) I I coach uh, and mentor podcasters. And uh, that's something that I preach a lot that without uh, preparation, I think is the way Michael Port puts it. Spontaneity is just winging it. Which doesn't work. Winging it is the fastest way to crash and burn ever. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) There is such a thing as plan spontaneity for sure. Well, how can we use some of these visual tools, Dan, to help us look at old things with a fresh pair of eyes? Talk to us about how to innovate this way. It's funny. You know, innovation is such a buzzword out here. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, and my gosh, it's been well over a decade now that anytime you go into a meeting, the number one word that's guaranteed to come up is innovation. And in the (laughs) sense that, you know, we're going to innovate our way out of this slump or We want to become, you know, in the old days, we used to say we want to become the apple of our business because they innovate better than anybody else. That's awesome. But one of the things you never really hear is, well, why do we need to innovate? Hmm. And more importantly, okay, if we understand why we need to do it because the world's changing, how do we really do it? And I'll tell you, the best way to innovate is not to convene a brainstorming session, (laughs) say, okay, everybody put on your thinking caps for the next hour. Nobody's leaving this room until we've captured our best ideas. Here's the problem. The brain does not do well under stress. The brain gets into its fight or flight mode. Some of us are blessed with the ability while in, a, in a high stress to come up with great ideas. Some of us think we get an adrenaline rush from that. Probably true. But studies show that the brain under stress is not a brain that is making its best decisions. Mm-hmm. And when you put people in a room and say, okay, you've got an hour to brainstorm, guess what? You've just invited stress into the room because people start to say, well, I, I don't know. How do I brainstorm? What's my best idea? Da, 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 da. So, so here's where I would like to change that. The simplest way to innovate something is to imagine what the process is or what's the problem that you think might have a better solution. And we'll just take the classic Steve Jobs Apple equation with an iPhone. So, you know, phones existed, mobile phones existed for a really long time. And, you know, whether you had your BlackBerry or you had your Motorola Razor or whatever you had, they were great. They were great machines. But you might remember you were always touching little tiny keys and there was no screen or a tiny little screen. And so the problem was, you know, as Steve Jobs said it, these phones suck. So (laughs) what do you do? You take and map out the way the thing works today that you just don't think is very effective, and you literally turn it upside down, or you turn it backwards, and you say, what would happen if I reversed the order of this of the process today? Or what would happen if I took the way that this works now from the top down and turned it over, and now it works from the bottom up? Do I see something in that visual that triggers me to think differently about this idea. And I call these 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 kind of innovation prompts. Uh, in Draw to Win, I've, I've broken it down, I think, into six or seven of the key prompts. And these are summarized from a lot of the work of other people as well. If you've got to come up with a better solution, a better mousetrap, the simplest way to do it is take an existing mousetrap and put it upside down and say, what would happen if I did it exactly backwards? And 
our simple drawings lend themselves to that very, very well. Because what you do is you just draw out a series of steps and say, this is the way it works now. What would happen if I reverse the order? Would I get a better solution? This isn't going to guarantee that you're going to come up with a better mousetrap, but it is going to guarantee that you're going to come up with ideas for alternative versions. And that's where innovation is going to come from. Make sense? Yeah. And to the to the Steve Jobs uh, iPhone example, I think that's, is it Prompt 5, where you, you talk about reducing the number of pieces instead of a bunch of buttons? It's like one button. Yeah. Well, in fact, you know, Toyota is notorious for this in a really good way. For anybody who's who's following kind of the big tenants in, in, in business thinking, you know, Toyota has been a leader in innovative process management for a long time. They talk about the Toyota production system and they talk about lean and they talk about agile and all these things that in many ways can kind of be traced back to some of the original thinking work that was done at Toyota. And what Toyota does is they're masters of this because they will take and make a crazy statement. They'll say, we want to create cars, which don't just consume less gas, but let's think really big. We want to create cars that actually contribute beneficially to the environment every time you turn them on. Mm. Now, that sounds like an absurd, impossible goal, and that's the point. Because what you're doing is you're taking sort of conventional wisdom, and just as I suggested, you're turning it on its head. And one of my favorite examples really is the genesis of the Tesla car, um, where the original engineering team, long before Elon Musk and crew even got involved, were thinking, Historically, cars have existed for, you know, about 100 years. And right from the beginning, if you were trying to engineer an automobile, you had to make a decision from day one, which was, am I going to make this car very, very powerful or am I going to make this car very, very efficient? And the two were at opposite ends of a spectrum because if you were going to make a powerful car, by definition, it had to be inefficient. And if you were going to make a very fuel efficient car, by definition, it was not very powerful. And that truth, that was a truth in automotive engineering for about 100 years until this group came along and said, well, what would happen if we intentionally decided to break that paradigm and made an automobile that was both hyper efficient and hyper powerful? What would we have to do? What in engineering speak would we have to break in order for that to happen? And then if you looked into it, the answer was simple. The internal combustion engine. That was the thing that obligated you to make this decision. So if you say, well, if we replace the, uh, you know, a gas-powered engine, what options are there out there that are efficient and powerful? And all of a sudden, the answer comes, electricity, mm-hmm. super efficient and super powerful. And so I like this example because it is explicitly based on taking what we know to be the truth now and explicitly, intentionally breaking it in half and building it backwards to see if a better solution comes out the other side and you can do that visually very easily. Well, I have a couple of uh, questions I want to ask you, Dan, not directly related to the book. But before we do that, I want to give you a chance to share with us anything else about the book you want to make sure we know. I will say that whenever a Dan Rome book comes out, uh, I get excited because to me, Dan Rome books are among the funnest to read. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. Well, they're, you know why they're fun to read is because they're fun to write because I love what I do. I mean – I always say this when I go into a meeting, um, and I mean it, and it's the absolute truth. No matter what the presentation is about or the sales or the meeting, I always know that I get to have the fun job because I'm the person who gets to draw the pictures, and everybody lightens up. It doesn't matter what we're talking about. We could be talking about healthcare reform. We could be talking about tort reform. We could be talking about, oh my gosh, horrific process management issues, and I say, I get to have fun because I'm going to draw the pictures, and everybody sits up. And they say, yeah, let's do it. Let's mm-hmm. do it. And that's the, what I tried to convey in the book. And I guess, Jeff, since you asked, one other thing I'd say about Draw to Win. For people who haven't actually physically seen the book or held it, it's small. And that's by design. It is a small book. I've written big, thick books in the past. And intentionally with this one, I said, everybody's really busy these days. I want the book to be as fun as my funnest meeting has ever been, which mm-hmm. means it's short, it's visual, and it's enjoyable to read. So um, I really encourage people to take a look because I think it's kind of, uh, in my mind, it's, it's, it's really appealing, just the form factor of the book. And uh, I hope people have a chance to take a look. It's fun to read. I read it uh, on a flight to San Diego from Nashville uh, last week. Easy, quick read, uh, enjoyable read for sure. And everybody on the plane wants to know, what's that about? Are, are you an artist? <laughs> I, you know, I always – I learned this as an author a few years ago. Always, always take two copies of the book with you where, wherever you go. And it's not because you're trying to – you know, you're not a huckster. You're not out selling them. A conversation will invariably come up. What do you do? Well, 
I draw pictures for business people. You what? <laughs> and I say, well, here, let me show you what I mean, and I'll haul out a book, and then I just give them away, and, and uh, it's it's a lot of fun. <laughs> well, it's been a little over two years since we, we last talked. I'd, I'd be curious to know, Dan, um, what, if any, uh, books during that time you've read, other books that have had an impact on you. What's What's been out there that you've been really moved by? There are two books that just – I'm so glad you asked this – that just come <laughs> immediately leap to the top of my mind. And both of them are a little bit older than two years. They're both probably three years ago, mm-hmm. four years ago now, but they both stay with me. The first one was Moonwalking with Einstein by Joshua Four. It is the best book I've ever read on how memory works. Mm. And for anybody who's become familiar, if you've ever watched Sherlock, the BBC version of the show, mm. there's a term that's kind of entered into pop psychology and to a certain degree, even into the business world about this notion of the memory palace as a way to help you build a, in your mind's eye a picture of a story that you want to tell and how you assign objects in this palace in your mind certain meaning so that when you're trying to tell a story, verbally narrate it, you can call those objects back and remember them. Well, this whole thing came from Joshua Four's book, Moonwalking with Einstein, where he learned how do memory athletes, and yes, that exists, that is a thing, <laughs> learn to improve their memories. And they're these ancient, ancient, way back to the Greeks, memory techniques, and I love it. So that's one And the second one is Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. And that to me in probably has in some ways has become my go-to book when I'm feeling down, when I'm feeling like the world is just a terrible place and I need a shot of optimism. Because what Daniel Kahneman tells us is breaks down in a better way than anything I've ever read, how the human brain really works, why people make good decisions, why sometimes we make bad decisions, and how to understand that enough to clarify the air, to recognize when we do need to think really fast and when we can have an opportunity to slow it down. And a lot of the lessons that come out of that book are things that are directly applicable to drawing to win, to being visual. How do you uh, appropriately frame a conversation before you have it? How do you do something called positive priming versus negative priming? And it's a it's a very important technique in in sales in particular because – The studies that Kahneman uh, cites show that if someone is smiling before they go into a meeting, they're probably going to come out having made better better decisions than someone who ended that meeting (laughs) frowning. Um, And that's positive priming and lots of important rules. So those are my two favorites. Mm. I just continue to go back to them. Excellent recommendations. Well, with the book literally just having come out, are you at a place where you're just trying to catch your breath or or are you already thinking about the next thing? What's, What's on the horizon for you? Oh my gosh, Jeff, there is never a time to slow down. And, and no, with one book out, yeah, you got a lot of energy. And what I use is that's the opportunity to start thinking about the next one. So, you know, th- the real truth to me is uh, we have to take these kind of tools into education. And I'm talking at a college, but even more importantly, at a high school and a junior high and even a middle school and elementary school level, because I've got two daughters. They're doing fine in school. I spend a lot of time with their teachers. I spend a lot of time in school. I love it. We are missing so much in, in as we move increasingly towards kind of standardized testing and learning by rote. It's the same. This is the same song that people have been singing for a long time. When we can tap into the power of our visual mind, it is incredible how smart we become. Mm. And I really want to work, and I'm working with a team of people to to really share, are there some basic tools that we could encourage our teachers to share with their students? that would open their minds to more visual possibility. But even more importantly, kids love to draw. Why are we not taking advantage of that? And and probably the most poignant part of the whole thing, I think, is that when we're learning to read, you'll remember your Dr. Seuss books or your chapter books or whatever you were, whatever you were looking at, your picture books. Isn't it crazy that you learn to read? And most kids love to learn to read when they're looking at books with great uh, pictures in them. And then once you get really good with reading, they take the pictures away. And they say, now you're smart enough. You don't need the pictures anymore. And all of a sudden, it becomes tedious again. Mm-hmm. I mean, what the heck? <laughs> if, if we learned to read with pictures and words, why would we not continue to learn how to think in increasingly complex ways by combining our words and our pictures? So 
simple answer, education, education, mm-hmm. education. It's the key. Well, uh, Dan, this has been a treat, uh, as it always is, whenever I get a chance to talk to you, whether it's in person after a presentation or, or here on the show. So thank you so much for giving us an excuse to have you back on. I really appreciate that. It's It's been a true, true pleasure. I love it, Jeff. Thanks so much. And your comment about it being fun, that's the one that rings the most true to me. So thank you. Dan's work has influenced my own over the years, especially in the area of public speaking and more specifically building and putting together presentations. If you'd like my presentation toolbox ebook for free, you can get that right now. A couple of ways. If you're in the state, just text the word toolbox to 33444. Outside the U.S., just go to readtoleadpodcast.com and make sure you're signed up for my mailing list. Again, that's readtoleadpodcast.com. If you want to check out the show notes for this episode, just add the number 143 to that URL. That's readtoleadpodcast.com slash 143. If you enjoy the Read to Lead podcast, it would mean so much to me if you'd take a moment to rate and review us in iTunes, Stitcher, or your app of choice iTunes helps a great deal. To rate us in iTunes, just go to readtoleadpodcast.com slash iTunes and thanks in advance. That's going to do it for this week. I look forward to seeing you next time for the next episode of the Read to Lead podcast. Thanks so much for listening to the Read to Lead podcast. As a subscriber, we challenge you to be more than just a passive listener. Become a vital member of the community. Visit us on the web at readtoleadpodcast.com. Until next time, remember, leaders read and readers lead. 